I've been thinking about the fact that I'm 68. Now that may sound obsessive, but there's a part of me that has a hunch that 68 ain't very far from 69. <laughs> and for whatever significances you might attach to 69, because <laughs> there's a lot of them in this room that you could have done. Uh, the real stupid suspicion behind all that is that 70 is a blink of eye away. Because the way my life has gone, it just seems that the older I get, just the faster things happen. And um, it seemed just yesterday that some of you I just met. And then there's all these new ones that I'm meeting. And, um, you know, and you guys don't help. <laughs> you know, when you bring up and introduce me to your mom. <laughs> or, you, you know, and you realize that, or you come up to me and say, I saw you in 1986 and I still want this question answered that I asked, wanted to ask back then. I wondered if you'd talk to me about it now. And I wonder how you hold on to a question like that. <laughs> and the, the fact is that um, uh, as you age, there's uh, a, a gratitude that occurs. Um, part of that gratitude is just that you're here. I have a dear friend, I called him, he's 78, and I, I said, how are you? And he says, I'm standing on the corner of 14th Street in New York. I said, that doesn't tell me how you are. He says, anytime I'm standing anywhere, Patrick, it's a good day. <laughs> and I think, I feel that sometimes. I have been through enough now um, in terms of my own health issues, and as you know, I had some close calls, and, and, and certainly uh, losing Susie was uh, an education beyond belief. And uh, the reality is, um, I have a lot of gratitude. We have a guy at Pine Grove that is a black man who is um, been through a lot in his life and been in prison and he works as a, as a uh, counselor associate and he works hard to stay sober and, and uh, he talks about the fact when he gives a meeting he says, he starts off, he says, you know, I stand here and I don't, I don't feel like I deserve to be here because I'm lucky. I'm lucky to be standing here that people cared enough, there was enough people around me to get me here. And I think of my life as an addict, and I think of the near misses in my life, and all the things that could have happened, that could have ever prevented me from being with you today, and there were many. And um, so I have gratitude, because I feel I'm lucky. I mean, I, I get to do this. And um, part of the gratitude that I also feel is I think about Sash. And um, what an extraordinary organization that is. And I, I was unaware in preparing these thoughts that, uh, in fact, there would be so many new people. Um, but I, I would first tell you that uh, it is um, meaningful to me that all the fatality of this organization is going on. Uh, Marcus talked about the new trainings that Sessions did, but you also have, in addition to that, you got lots of new books. You got the book that all these women collaborated on, worked hard on to support that. What an achievement. You got books 
Um, I look at um, you know people who are from Tripoli and and, and Claudia Black and Stephanie's new book and the new the sexual addiction storm that I just became aware of. Then uh, uh, Kelly McDaniel. I mean, I, the, the reality is is there's all this thinking that's going on in this community. Yeah, it's not cohesive, but it's not all on the same page. But the fact is, <laughs> it's a vibrant organization that's trying to make things better. Trying to make things better. And that's really important to me. As a, I don't know, elder of the tribe, I guess, <laughs> you take pride in the fact that what's, that people are putting in the time. Um, when I think of SASH, I think that much of all the organizations I've ever belonged to, this is probably the one that has mattered the most. I have been in the most. Um, I have lots of scenes too. That I mean, I come in here and and I think of times that probably people will never tell you about. Some of them really raucously, raucously funny. Some really funny things happened, which will forever be secret. <laughs> Some that were public. I remember an event where we invited. Uh, we were into indigenous healers, so we invited people, you remember this, and we had Chief Kahuna of the Hawaiian people, we had people from the Alkali Lake Band, we had people from all over various uh, Chinese medicine, I mean we had leaders from all of those fields come in and talk to us about what goes into healing, and we all made face masks, which I still have, I saw mine the other day, I have it hanging on the wall of the cabinet. I was thinking about that day, and, and, and Deb Corley and I are crawling around trying to make sure that everybody has enough pace to make their face and their, <laughs> you know, things like that. It, it was a gas and the, the biggest moment is that there was a moment where we all turned to our separate rooms and the Chief Kahuna put his thing down and every door shut and then there was this thunder that went through the whole building. I swear to God, there, and all of us saying, oh my God, what's he going to do now? You know, it was like, made you stop and think. We also had tough moments, and um, the truth is, there are moments that Sash almost stopped. There are moments, um, uh, not every board was successful, not every president was successful. We had one, and I think there are people in here where there was no preparation for the annual conference, and when people were walking in the door, we were still figuring out, a bunch of us gathered together, how we were gonna put it together. I'll never forget that, but I'll tell you what I did learn. That there is a stamina, and I, I, the people that stand out for me are Linda Hudson and Deb Corey. Without those two women, I don't know, we wouldn't be here today. stamina and uh, and I have appreciated our recent presidents I have I appreciate um, Marcus's efforts I appreciate um, all that about it does um, and I the joke about my hair being on fire I mean sometimes you think of that I mean she is she is gets so stressed with the things she's got to do and the point I'm making though is when I watch she has resources. She's got lots of you to help. There's a board helping her. There's, but I watched Deb Corley and, and the Hudson Pole just out of sheer drive. And I saw members, uh, some of whom are here, walk in. And we had a Jesus meeting where we passed baskets because we did not have enough money to pay the hotel. 
That's where we were. And look at us now. Look at us. Growing, vibrant, new initiatives, people writing, <coughs> all that happening. Also, this is uh, one of the things I'm aware of, is this is where, in historically, some of my best friends have. Yeah. You know, sometimes hard for me being here when there are so many people. Uh, and one of the things I noticed and was pointed out to me by my children is when all four of my children are present, it's really easy for me to dissociate because it's like there's too much matters at once. It's been one of the things I've had to work on in my life. <laughs> And so I get into a conference and I, it's, and, and all uh, people I genuinely love and, and care for, I get to see them so briefly, and there's a part of me that just gets overwhelmed with <clears throat> so many that, um, that I want to talk to, so I have trouble. I also have a age where I have trouble with the people who are not here. And um, there, there were some wonderful, wonderful people who were stalwarts in this organization that aren't here. So it makes me mindful about the fact that, um, you know, I have to be and have the realism that I look forward a little bit like Rory to being around to persecute people for a few more years. <laughs> Plan on that. <laughs> Because I, the questions are important, I want to raise them. But I'm also aware and have watched and have learned the lesson is you can't count on anything. I don't know how much time I got. So I, when I thought about this speech today, I wanted to, to talk about it from the perspective of my experience in SASH. And also to, um, if, what, what would I have to pass on? And I want to be in the spirit of a fair witness uh, of what I've observed. And, um, and my hope is, is that this will be a way to help us think through where the future is. So that's, that's the intent of this. <clears throat> Um, the other theme that goes with this is uh, about like, making it better. I believe that we're making things better in SASH. But it takes more to think about strategically, to think about, well, how do we um, really think through our purposes. And the way that I start with that is thinking about how I got into this. Um, I have been in sex addiction recovery for about five years, starting in 77, <coughs> and have written out of the shadows. And we have been treating sex addiction in a clinical setting, and I had been in meetings for some time. And I had developed a friendship with a, a, a guy who was tasked, he was, a, he was a, a minister who was tasked with the job of creating the sex abuse treatment plan for the state of Minnesota. He was basically in charge of state policy around sexual abuse. Uh, the irony in it is this only qualification for that was in those in the early 80s, you have to start thinking back what it was like in the early 80s because people didn't know a lot about sex abuse. His only qualification really was that he had spent 20 years studying the Inui and their sexual practices. So that's all that he had is their rich. So he was an anthropologist. But we became really good friends and I always loved even when he came into a treatment center and he looked at the staff as a strange native tribe, what did that really mean? Um, as a good friend, though he called me one day and he said, I want you to come to the conference and I think 
you would enjoy it. I'd like to go with you. University of Minnesota, I said, I go. And uh, so we went, and in the conference, uh, the opening session was a keynote session where the a presenter was from um, Yale. And um, she had a case that she was presenting uh, with a pedophile who uh, was on death row Rivera. In her commentary, uh, what I was struck with was that she, as she talked about him, I could hear that she really didn't like him very much. In fact, made jokes about him. He had put on a huge amount of weight, which was one of the consequences of Tepper Provera. And one of the things that he said is, I'm doing this, look at me. <clears throat> on the film, he says, look at me, I am so grotesque, but I'm willing to do this because I want to quit so bad. And her response was, and this is a direct quote, we'll never forget it, was to say, well, really, you're just a fat slob. <clears throat> and what I heard in this audience right now was a reaction, which was my reaction, which was when that happened, um, that there would be people who would say, how do you talk about a patient like that and do it publicly? Um, that's wrong. But underneath that was a deeper pain, because when I started getting help, I weighed 350 plus pounds. And the fact is, I didn't do what he did. Different set of sexual behaviors, but for the grace of God, that could have been me. And I walked out of the meeting, and I went and I sat down by the Mississippi River and on a park bench, and I just started to cry. I just, because I could see people who got better. I could see them in the 12-step communities. I could see them clinically. And I just, to have that level of disrespect hurt to hear. And my friend Tom came and sat down next to me, and he put his arm around me. And he said, I wanted you to hear that because I wanted you to know what it was going to be like for you. To try to get understanding for those people as human beings who are struggling for help. A lot of people don't see it the way you do. And given your own history, it's going to be hard. But he left me alone on the bench, and I resolved that day that I would do everything that I could in my life. <laughs> to fight what I now saw as prejudice. A deep prejudice against sexual differences. A deep prejudice against mental health, really. The stigma. <coughs> and I, and to use the language of a Joseph Campbell, that's when I heard my call. That really crystallized. And I'd like, as we start, for you to think about something, and that is to think about the fact of what brought you here. Every one of you had a moment when you decided to get into this crazy business. And you know, whatever the differences are, you're in this room for some reason, and that isn't because you walked up the staircase and down the staircase and you ended up in the site. <laughs> Don't think that's how you got here. You got here because you had patience, you had a family, you had an experience, you had a husband, you had a something. So the reality is, is that that call is being heard in lots of places. 
And Sash is poised at an extraordinary opportunity. And I think that Alex's comment that we are in a crisis is really true. And I would add to that, I think we're not only in a crisis, I don't think we have much time. I take very seriously what we're about. So, I'm going to take a digression for a moment. Because there's a note I want to um, start on. I think the idea of, um, so it's going to seem a little tangential, but it will come back is I think that all of psychotherapy is getting better, that, that there are new technologies that are still very primitive. Um, like, do you remember, in a, those of you who ever watched Star Trek? Uh, there's younger people who don't know what Star Trek is, which is really Star Trek. <laughs> but there is a Star Trek scene, I think it's in Star Trek IV, when they go back to rescue the whales, and they're in the hospital, and Dr. McCoy is walking down the hospital and then he asks this woman, what are you there? And she says, I'm on dialysis. And he says, dialysis? We're back in the Middle Ages. <laughs> and he gives her a pill that she, she sits right up and she's fine and it's all cured because he had something he could do. You know, I, I would imagine there will be a time when people will look back at this time and say, you know, dialysis. <laughs> There's some of us that are doing dialysis. So, we have to be open to possibilities. A man that I respect a lot is a guy by the name of Dan Amon, who has said that one of the problems is that mental health is one of the few parts of medicine that doesn't systematically study the organ they're treating. And it's not just about knowing about the brain, but actually looking at the brain of the patient that you're treating. That every brain, that we need to get to a point where we have improved technology. Now, I, we have this very interesting perspective right now because we have DSM committees, both of whom are looking at <coughs> hypersexual sex addiction issues. And uh, for four years, I've met with the APA committee on the process addictions section of the DSM and I remember this will be the fifth year I'm back to, to talk to the APA about this. And one of the things when I showed these slides as an example, um, a guy said to me, he says, of course, you know, with a spec scan, you can, you can find anything you want in them. So there's a prejudice against this guy. But what I admire about Dan Arman is this. He we had to start somewhere. Had to start somewhere, and he's starting to look at pictures. And one of his points, which I think I think everybody in the room would agree to, if somebody has brain damage that prevents them to do therapy, it is useless to have them sitting in a therapist doing, trying to do therapy with them, if they in fact can't do therapy. And so one of the advantages of that is that if you look at this is, this is, and he's done an interesting article simply because he is working at getting better and he's talking about sex addiction and he did a whole article on sex addiction. And he's showing, this is a, just one example, showing the kind of uh, scalloping that's occurring in the brain of a sex addict and then as they progress in recovery, the advantage is this thing controls on me. This woman here has a, when her son was three, took my iPhone and reprogrammed it for me. And her mother's not different than the kid. But the point being between the two is to show that in fact that the brain fills out and is, recovery does make a difference. And the whole point of the article is, he says, when spouses see the damage that goes on in the brain, it lowers the reactivity because, as, he, as a case he presented, oh my god, honey, you got, your, your brain is broken. There's something wrong here. 
and it brings it into where there's a, a biological component to it. And also look in that there's, if nothing else, we are going to become educators of teaching people how to heal their brains. How to improve their brains so that they can function differently, because we know that they can. So the reality is, you know, what Dan Allen is doing is he's made his contribution to make it better. Now, footnote. My own experience with Dan Allen added some drama to that, because I went in just to see whether it worked or not. And I did it twice, once in Washington, D.C., and I did it once in Newport Beach. My dad was an alcoholic, and he battered my mother, and he did batter me as a child. I gave no history. And the first thing out of both physicians' mouths is I said, were you a battered child? I said, how did you know that? I said, well, you've got lesions that only come from that kind of thing. So what Dan Armand did with me is, is that he said, that, you know, we can tweak some things, but there was a medication that made all the difference in the world for me because I struggled with despair most of my life, probably since childhood. And the last five years has been just virtually a miracle to me because I had the right medication. And, and my psychiatrist that, I, that helped me through Susie's death and what have you, he says, the match what Dan Armand did for you medically as a good psychiatrist is astounding. Really, I can see the difference it makes. Now, the other side of that is my wife Suzanne came in with me at that point in time and it was at her brain scan and when Dan Alman talked to her, she went off the rails because Dan didn't know it at the time, but he was uncovering her cancer. And there were things wrong in the brain and he said, Susie, now this is in, we knew in 2007 there was something wrong. He said, Susie, there's something really, really wrong here. There's only about 17% of your cerebellum that's functioning. There's parts here we don't understand. We, we need, and she, you know, it's one of those things where the reality of that made her so angry. And I have to say, Dan Amon was a good physician. He walked every step with the word and kindness. He was so kind to her, but she was so upset because she could see it. She could see the holes for the reason that we took her checkbook away because she couldn't make it work. We could, she, we could see it. And I had kids saying to me at the time, is there something wrong with mom? And I think you know what it is. I said, I don't know what it is. But it wasn't until I saw a brain scan, I knew we weren't crazy. Now it took us almost three years to sort out, and for me, a year going through medical charts, to really understand what happened. But her tumor, her first tumor was not in her breast, it was in her, it was in her brain. And it was in the skull. And it was missed by the early scannings, except for now. I offer it for you just simply because my own learning is it doesn't hurt to look and to see what sense we can make with these things. What occurs to me is, is that I believe that in three years, four years, five years, there are new technologies coming. I think that there are going to be all kinds of things that, the things that we are going to be struggling with three years from now, very different than the conversation we're having now. I think it's gonna happen that fast. Reason I say that is I watch what's happening across this, this whole planet. And I wanted to start with um, just the fact that there in, sex addiction is being dealt with in lots of other places. Interesting, tiny Sylvania. There's a physician there. The initiatives of working in that country, extraordinary what has been accomplished there. Uh, South Africa, 
business community there funded books and trainings and what have you because sex addiction needed to be addressed there. There is a SASH-like organization being formed in Europe, just like us. People from Stockholm, the Netherlands, London, gathering together to talk about these issues. So we're not alone. I want to tell you about Canada. One of the things that happened in Canada is that um, there is a foundation there that really wanted to change their country. And the way that they, they decided to do that is, first of all, what they did is they brought um, people together, and experts from all over the world, gave Harvard $2 million, brought people from Yale, brought people, uh, Betty Ford, um, a lot of early childhood people, because one of the things that the Canadians thought, that are being as practical people, that it's one thing to treat the problem, but let's get it before it is a problem. So early childhood education became the priority. And it's now, in the province of Alberta, it's a $146 million a year initiative on early childhood development so that those first two years of life that where attachment occurs, that people have a better shot, that parents are educated. And they created a chair, they created a whole division within the ministry to start with. I was impatient with that because I wanted them to get to be talking about the sex, the sex addiction side of this. So they pulled experts together, um, Canadian, worldwide, US, what have you, looking at issues on what goes into addiction and the uh, neurobiology. And there's a lot of agreement about what it was, about neurobiologically based, a gene inter environment interaction, um, issues around um, early development mattering, um, that there's neurobiological systems that were in fact at the same time they hired a Washington think tank by the name of Frameworks. And the Frameworks people went out and asked the public what they thought. And they what the existing public attitudes were, and the existing public attitudes were um, literally a lot of what you would expect. There was agreement. There was agreement on you know that there um, that the early developmental issues and the family matter and what have you, uh, but there was a, a definitional ambiguity that was shared between the public and the experts and us. But also that um, willpower was a matter of, that if they just said no, that it could be changed. And so what they set out to do is they set out to educate the public. And the way that they would do it is they, they started saturating cable TV. You're sitting in a hospital waiting room, you're sitting in the subway, what have you. In Canadian TV, what would happen is people would be educating them about addiction. So let's take this one as an example. <laughs> Criteria for addiction. We're talking about excessive use, um, doing things beyond what we planned, whether it's eating or spending or having sex, um, where it has impact on day-to-day -day life. I told a story this morning about uh, in a survey, one of my patients responded that these are my behaviors, and the person running the survey said, "Well, how does that differentiate me from anybody in your community?" He said, "Well, when I do those things, my life is awful, and when I don't." Do things, my life works. So it's looking at the consequences and the fallout from the behaviors and how that becomes a pattern that has its own life. So we have Jess Montgomery, who sits on your board as a psychiatrist on Canadian TV, educating the public. And what they did is they really focused just on Alberta, especially Calgary, um, and with the idea is, can they educate the public to become more knowledgeable about addiction? And so one of the things that they started to do then is they surveyed after they went through this process and found 
that when people started thinking about the problems, and this, I, I'm, I'm aware that I thought I had an hour to do this, and we are now, you know, I'm at 10 minutes, so I don't know how I'm going to do all that I packaged in here. But the net effect is that when people were asked, what do you need help with, the top three things they need help with, um, the top one was sex, second was cocaine, third was work. And it opened the ideas, policymakers, government, in terms of thinking about it. Now the whole idea then is they're changing how they're doing things in the province and they're starting in the medical school by educating physicians about addiction. And they're changing the medical system and getting the doctors on board to understand and be comfortable about talking about addiction. And so the reason I bring this up is, is that they then are going to do what they learn from that about what works. They want to spread throughout Canada. Things like that are happening all over the world. And so it's one of the things that many of us have thought, and I want to let you know this is happening, is that next April there is an international conference in New York, the first one. But uh, countries from all over, people are coming to talk about sex addiction in their respective countries. And the hidden agenda, and our policy makers are going to be there. And one of the things that um, is a dialogue. And one of the things that we, that are in ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, will be there. We're, we've invited the sexology organizations. Um, we've invited the folks from AXA. And one of the things behind the scenes that there are things that all of us are concerned about because we all run into issues that are about social policy. And um, what I'm hoping is that there will be a and Sash is going to be there, Marcus is going to be there, we're going to be there to talk with the other workers about what kind of common agreement we can come up with about this country. Because there's things that go on that we all shake our heads at, but that we're not speaking up about. We're not on TV educating, we're not, we're no, we're not doing strategizing around. So uh, I'm hoping that we as a country learn from others and are able to go forward in a more effective way. Um, because I think that, the, and you heard it in some of the earlier comments, when I was trained, I was trained by Norman Sprintfall who told me that the biggest problem in research is, is that they split up the practitioners from the research scientists because it's the people who do the work that should be asking research questions. And they're overlooked. And um, he says, and that means that clinicians got to be good consumers of science, got to be good consumers of science. And scientists need to be in the trenches some to really get, even if it is only 10, 12 hours a week, that, that you've got to have that kind of experience. And the other part that he talked about is, is that it's really important that the clients also have a voice in this. No disease entity ever got what it needed until people who had the problem were able to articulate what it was like to be in their skin. And we're talking about AIDS, we're talking about things that had tremendous stigma that has turned around by patients who literally have had the problem. That's where we're at. And so when you think about this, there's really a tension. I believe all of life is living with tension when not everything is easy. I mean, I think that's, Jung talked about this, just the spirituality of living with another person. How do I be true to myself? How do I be true to you? There's an in-between there that's uncomfortable. I think this organization is in-between in spots that's uncomfortable. We have to live with the in-between because that is the most productive place for us to be, where we know what the next right thing is. And you have to have at least the clinicians 
and the people from science, the people from public policy, and the people from recovery need to be able to talk to one another. Now, I think about that, and from the point of view of recovery, and I just want to say that SASH was started by recovering, recovering sex addicts and their family members with the purpose of having um, like patterned after the National Council on Alcoholism where you had a local, a local chapter and uh, when, when the state attorney general says something really idiotic, there are people around to respond to that. So I recently heard one of our state attorney generals say, if somebody looks at pornography, they are going to be a pedophile and we're going to arrest them. Education needed. Okay. And then I look at models here in Texas. Look at Houston Council on Alcoholism. Science, you know, you've got Baylor is now so intimately involved in all the research projects. They brought in the manager folks that, uh, and it's an annual budget of $23 million a year for just that city to have discussions about, not everybody's agreed about what alcoholism is, but there was a local chapter. And then we tried that for a while. It didn't work out for us because some of the states, we never had an agreement to about the money. You know how you join a society and you have a, a local membership and a national membership? That agreement never got worked out. And some of the local chapters decided to go their own way. It was a mess. That was another episode in our, in our history. The point is, is that, but, but the original purpose was to get, make it safe for recovering people and that they could join an organization and they didn't have to give up their anonymity and they could be part of the articulation. The interesting thing to me is that when we went on kind of a national basis, I started thinking there was an estimate out of, uh, at that time, it was called the National Council on Sex Addiction and Compulsion. And the estimate was there was 125,000 people a week going to meetings. We now have about 45,000 people going every week, and that's increasing about 10% a year. That's what the best statistics we can come up with at the moment. Interesting thing was there was a big drop in 12-step attendance when managed care came in, and it affected everything, including AA. AA dropped almost um, 800,000 members in four years when managed care came in. And we could spend, I would like to spend time talking about what the implications, but the implications are supporting people in those fellowships uh, is an important part. And we are becoming more clear about why the 12 steps work. Um, this most recent one from substance abuse, talking about people who sponsor others. Remember, we talk about attachment issues and how that changes how their success works. I love this book uh, by Nasser Gaimi. He's, um, his basic thesis is, is that great leadership comes from people who have been either had addiction or mental health problems. Kennedy, Lincoln, um, Martin Luther King, uh, people from business. Uh, that basically, he says, if you're going to have a crisis, you want to have somebody who's either a drunk or crazy <laughs> to run your country. When you, when you really have a crisis, you do not want somebody who has mental health. <laughs> because they always do poorly. The people who come in are like Winston Churchill. And why is that, he says? He says, because people who have mental illness know about perseverance, know about thinking outside of the box, know how to respond to crises, and have a resilience that most people do not have. And in fact says that uh, their weakness in short is their strength, and that counter to a deep cultural stigma accompanying mental illness, I suspect that it may be our species' deepest biases, so even more so than racism or sexism. <laughs> And I think we can say, now this is a new play, <laughs> therapists are either really crazy, or another way you could talk about them is they're the guardians of our greatest human assets. 
or they may be, if this is true, the most critical of our mental health practitioners. And long term, it may be that when medicine really plays its way out, that could be true. Oh, I have a brief story that I want to say, and then um, and I'll try to get through the rest of this. And it's a, a Minnesota story, and it's a Sven and Ole story. <laughs> Ole was on a cruise ship, and it crashed. And so he was marooned on an island, the only one there. And when the crew that rescued him got there, he says, I want to show you what I did for the last 12 years, <laughs> waiting to be rescued. This is the house I built. This is where I lived. This is the barn I built. And this is where I farmed what I could find. And then this is the church that I go to. The crew that rescued him said, but there's another building over there. He says, oh, yeah, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> <laughs> now, I found that funny because I think that people get stuck so much that we get into these prejudices. Have you ever seen a church take sides on things in the church I used to go to? I think there's a lot of that going around in which there's a prejudice or a righteousness about it. And I was riding on a, uh, on a, a plane uh, two weeks ago, and there's a guy sitting next to me. He says, I'm in the movie industry. And he says, oh, you're know, all in recovery. He says, oh, there's no shyness about it. We're kind of waiting for the rest of the culture. He says, but I've been in AA for four years. And he says, you know, I got these spots, these, and they're sex addicts. And um, I'm really trying to, one of them's got so much sexual energy, he could run a third, third world country. <laughs> he says, I don't know what, what to do with them. But you know, so I finally just said, I won't, unless you go to meetings, unless you get some help for this, unless you make your S meetings, I will no longer help you. Because you're going to die this way. And he said, then he said to me, and I'm getting out of line to who I was. He asked me if I knew anything about sex addiction. <laughs> I said, but I do know about recovery. I've been in the you know, program for a long time. So we talked about this. And he, and he said, you know, this thing when AA talks about a singleness of purpose, it's a mistake. AA is making a mistake. Because I look at a wine bottle, I can't imagine just having one drink. I understand what the sex addict's up against. And, you know, we're all getting mixed together. And that's changing things. And what I think happens is we take recipes and we make them sacerdotal, in other words, holy, when they're not. They're simply recipes. And so one of the issues that I'd like to raise, and one of the things that I've tried to think about from a 12-step point of view, is to raise it from going just thinking steps or silo mentalities of AA, OA, GA, but to think on a larger level. And that's where my thinking has always been, is, is that there's a larger set of principles involved. Clinically, I thought of this, I a Moody poem, and um, read it to you, a craftsman pulled a reed from the reed bed, cut holes in it, and called it a human being. Since then, it's been wailing the tender agony of parting, never mentioning the skill that gave him life as a flute. And I thought about that, you know, the flute gets made, the player of the flute, what have you. We never even think of the flute maker. I think that's what happens in therapy. You interview people, you know, they talk about their recovery, they talk about the hard work they've done, but the therapists, the many therapists that they have helped them over the years, you forget who got you there. And so my question was, I heard Ken Adams say, but in the trenches, this is how it looks. <coughs> this is how it looks. You see this pattern. Who supports them? Who acknowledges them? How do we do this? How do we get input from the clinicians so that, 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 that it informs our research, informs our public policy? And I love this book called The Psychopathic Test by John Watson uh, because it is a history of how psychopathy has been measured over time 
at, at parts, it is saddening, part it is it is um, disturbing, uh, sometimes really funny. Uh, he makes a comment, and he, as he started reading, he says, you know, if you look at the DSM, all of life is in there. You can find yourself anywhere. <laughs> and I thought, how many of us have read DSM prescriptions, and you wonder, well, I think I'm a little bit like that. You know? And, and the whole issue about, okay, so what goes into this? And I was really struck by a discussion um, at, on the process addiction committee about that the measurement has to be psychometric, which is stunning for people who come out of medicine to say, I think. So uh, the reality is we're, 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 we're making things better. John Kerr's book, A Dangerous Method, just put me onto this. It's about Freud, Jung, and those early years, and I read that book, and you know what? Uh, they were trying their best. I mean, they were concerned about hysteria, and I think they were right about the German psychiatrist versus the French. I think the Germans were more hysteric at the time. That's my And But the point is, they're having a conversation that has long changed, but started somewhere. Freud talked about sexual abuse didn't realize the significance that the most important part of this work is not, was not what he paid attention to in some ways. Do you follow what I'm saying? In other words, he was wrong about where the energy needed to be. And I realize I've been wrong about many things, both personally and professionally. And every person in this room currently is wrong about something. <laughs> We're all wrong about something. Because as you age, you realize back then you were wrong about something. <laughs> so we're all wrong about something. And so the issue, though, that I think is, is to look back historically how you're making things better. And so I, my first laptop weighed 42 pounds. The one I have now was 3 pounds. I love making old boats run and old motors for lots of reasons. My daughter Stephanie, she likes a new boat. You turn it on, it goes where it's supposed to, it's probably free, the kids can play on it. Me, I like the, the old stuff. And um, and there's things that happen, you know, I, I get Ralph, for example, I get my new stuff. Okay, the only problem is you put Ralph in a boat, bad stuff happens. <laughs> Now, there's two sides to that story, and if Bart Mandel were here today, you would hear about both sides of that, and they would blame each other. <laughs> Problem is, and, what I, what I, and I have a friend who, you know, when he exasperated over World War III, and this is why he made him better. We, we bought uh, a boat last year that has been perfect for our family, and I'm amazed at this motor, and it runs well. I can't believe how inexpensive it is to run. We improved it. Psychotherapy's like that. It's not like it was in 1909. We're already, we have made it dramatically better. And that's the thing, as clinicians, we need to keep in mind, and not get caught up in the church I used to go to and realize that we're trying to make it better. And I think from a science point of view, I'll never forget, I was on an internship with Harvey Colbert, or, or Colbert at Harvard, and his, his statistician was a runner, and I learned the wonders of a stopwatch, and I learned that sometimes when I ran really fast, when it was against a stopwatch, I was wrong. Or when I was slow, I was faster than I thought I was. I could not trust my own perceptions. The scientist is, you cannot, as a clinician, leave, just say that it's something that we don't need. We need the stopwatch. The scientist is an important part of this whole thing. And so what I think is happening is you're seeing shifts that are happening, or big things of what? ASAM's new definition of about being a brain disease. The food research is going to change how we look at things because it is further ahead than we are. We're further ahead therapeutically. They are further ahead from a science point of view. And um, Mark Gold's new book is really stunning in how it has pulled the, 
uh, stuff together. And there are other uh, <laughs> books. Uh, 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 this is coming from the Karen Foundation, who found that when they started looking at their chemical dependency population, they had 25% of the women, men and 26% of the women were also sex addicts. Now, you, that's one of the largest providers of chemical dependency services in the world. Realize they have 540 addicts probably coming to their Pennsylvania campus next year. The numbers matter. And so the story is growing, and I think that uh, you know, we, we need to, we need to, I think in the chemical dependency community, that church I used to go to is big and strong. And it's changing. This article by Radich, a unified framework for addiction, vulner uh, the vulnerabilities in the decision-making process, is a wonderful synthesis of the debates that have occurred and how so many parts of the truth could be built together. I see synthesis like that. I see Dan Siegel's nine domains of integration, which many of you know about. What he's saying is that, in effect, we are making the brain better. And, uh, and, and that's what the purpose of therapy is. In public policy, in short, our biggest health problem is addiction. If you add up the eating disorders, chemical disorders, what have you, it's our biggest expense. And Kurzweil and Grossman in their book Transcend say, you know, as bad as it's going to be, if you live eight more years, you're probably going to have your life extended. If you can get more eight more years, but the fact is, the one exception to that is addiction. Because we've not found out a way to make the synapses grow differently quickly. And that's, that's a clue to us. And I think when we look, for example, uh, at the story about how when ASAM got its accreditation that they had to pull sex out of it in order to get accredited. In other words, they traded off sex addiction as a diagnosis in order to be able to get their accreditation. That story is a public story. Um, and I think what we're battling is a story also that um, goes back to the French Revolution. This is Pennell taking the the chains off of the people in the uh, sanatorium, free mental health. And this is a picture of out of uh, early 19th century England where the court would go and look at the inmates for amusement. And I think we're in a culture that still looks at people who are addicted or have mental health problems for amusement and not looking at the deeper issues. And I think that one of the places we need to start, I agree with the people in addiction medicine who talk about that closing the gap between science and practice, you've got to start with the medical schools. And I think that one of the biggest crises we have is pornography, the new tobacco. This is a very provocative story about some of the politics. Tobacco as an industry was behind the ASAM decision not to include sex. And I think tobacco as an industry has a history of sexual exploitation that goes back many, many centuries. And there's dynamics there that we as an association need to be aware of. But the fact is, is that <clears throat> University of New Hampshire looking at about exposure and the fact that early exposure, 34% of kids, two thirds of kids using being sexual fifth, sixth grade, and I'm seeing patients now in their 30s who started when they were 10 or 11. We've got a problem, and it's coming, and it's bigger, and it has meaning for the whole fabric, because as Alexis said when we started off, the erosion of an intimacy in our culture is at stake, and how that works shapes how the culture rolls. And we are the largest producers of pornography, with four, last year 400 million pages, Germany, the closest second, the feminine, and all kinds of places for it to play out. And the other part, I just want to point out, on a policy level, Nora Vocal talking about, it's not simply a disease of the brain, but developmental disorder. Mark Gold talking about a developmental disorder. They're talking about what happens in the brain between the ages of 14 and 16. Critical. 
these are things that we need to talk about and not get caught in the church I used to go to. I want you to listen to this because it is a very useful summary done differently than I would say, but listen. It is an environment in which people become part of a, of a team effort, become part of a movement, so that everybody has an important role to play. The scientists are bringing new insights to the table, but the scientists don't know how to make policy. Policy people can think about, can listen to that science and think about how to turn that into <coughs> new policy ideas that are different from the expertise of the people who are working on the ground with, with parents and their kids who may feel like, wow, this is, this is too big for me. But in fact, the scientists and the policymakers are helpless without the insights of the people who provide services on the ground. Because ultimately, that's where it happens. And so it has to pass the test from the people on the ground who say, this makes sense. Uh, I can do this. If it doesn't make sense, it's not going to work. If people can't do it, it's not going to work. And sometimes the best ideas could come from people working with families and children who have an intuition or a hunch about things that they've done, but don't know how to put that in a science context and don't know how to develop a research design to test it, but might be some of the best sources of ideas. And that includes parents who are receiving services or programs. Um, we need their insights as well, because good ideas can come from anywhere. And, and together, all these pieces are going to have to work, or else a good idea it's going to kind of die on the vine somewhere. It has to work in the implementation end. It has to work on the policy end. And it has to make sense in terms of science, or else it's unlikely that it's going to be um, successful in multiple places if we make it. That's Jack Chonkoff from Harvard in the Child Development Center. I think what he's saying is so important for SASH that we need to live with the tension that all Four parts of these things need to be together. When, when you can get out in 18 months for having actually touched a child, but be away for 250 years because you have a picture of a child, there is something wrong in that culture. When the Federal Bureau of Prisons tells you that we're putting people in jail who don't belong there, when we have people make outrageous statements that need to be addressed that there would be common agreement on, we need to be have some way of making a voice. And one of the ways that we sharpen that up is when everybody counts. I would have said it different than Jack. I would have started with, not the parents, I would have started with the clients. They are <clears throat> our teachers. They have lots of great ideas. That's what happened in South Africa. It was South Africa. They started as clients on the business community. And right now in this country, business community is making a difference. Aetna is paying 100% for sex addiction. We are getting Blue Cross paying for sex addiction. Why? Because it's costing them money not to. There are forces at work that we have a chance now to really start a dialogue like we have never started before. And I'm so glad we have all these people that are here willing to work on it. But if you say, that we don't need the addicts, or we don't need to have meetings that involve addicts, then I'm a person who doesn't belong here. If we, we say we don't need the scientists and the people who understand good research design, and that they're crazy, or whatever, then you don't have your stopwatch. If we don't take care of our clinicians, we're going to lose them. And so you have to have science, you have to have clinicians, and you need to have the public policy people here listening to this discussion so that we can start influencing that policy. I have a grandson who's four years old. I love to tease him. And he has, we have a good relationship. I, I, I watched him when he came, Steffi came in the door and the kids are all over him. And I was joking about the fact that, you know, around her, of them, I'm chopped liver. And over supper, he gave some thought and he leaned back and he says, you know, Grandpa, you are chopped liver. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it with a straight face. And then he laughs and what have you. So I don't want you to think that I got any kind of special deal going too small with this kid. He's got no respect. I can't wait till I see him at 14. I can't wait till you have him at 14. <laughs> but I want to tell you this one thing I do with him because I like to, he's in the Ninja Logos. 
And of course, the Ninja logo says, Ninjas, you get the mission, and you're chosen to go on a special, and you need courage, and what have you, and the crisis is there. And so I will look at him, and I will, and he will, say, she'll tell him to go do something. And I will look at him with my best ninja voice, and I will say, but you have been chosen. <laughs> and the time is now. <laughs> the crisis is here. <laughs> and so I say to my colleagues and friends and associates in Sash, if you are the chosen, the reason that you're here brought you here for some reason. You are the chosen. And the time is now. Thank you. Thank you.